gentlemen, good morning. It's very great talking to you again. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy it as I'm going to enjoy talking to you all. Now, I'm going to talk on the comparative militaries of Russia and China in the present age, in the present time, vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. Now, everybody knows America is the number one superpower in the world. There's no doubt about that. But there are rising powers and you've got China and you've got Russia. Well, let's start with Russia. What is the efficacy of the Russian army? Now, that's a very important point. Now, efficacy means efficiency and the ability to deliver results. During the Second World War, the Russian army was very poorly led. And what happened, you all know. They lost battle after battle in the initial stages and for two years they were on the back foot. The Germans displayed superior technology, superior ability, superior strategic skills and almost two million Russian soldiers surrendered, hands up, give up. At least four field marshals or what they call in Russia marshals surrendered, were captured by the Germans. Russians picked up, fought well after that, but then it was a question of numbers being overwhelming over the Germans. If the Germans had 10, the Russians would put 40. And same thing, it was a preponderance of tanks against the Germans, and the Germans didn't have the same resources. And the net result was, the battle was weighted in favor of the Germans. But the Germans fought very well, there's no doubt about that part. But fighting very well has got no meaning because overall they lost against the Russians and the Russians believed at that time they formed a system of warfare that means a massive artillery barrage with air bombardment and then the infantry would move after that. The idea was to soften the defenses of the enemy. And they continued with the same philosophy now. The war has changed. And they perhaps thought that in Ukraine, the same tactics will start. So they made an invasion of the Russian, uh, the Ukrainian cities of Kiev and Kharkiv. The aim was very clear. The Russians may deny it now, but the aim was to replace the Ukrainian regime. They failed. That massive force advancing towards Kyiv was halted in its tracks and the Russians then withdrew. That was a grave miscalculation on the part of the Russians. They changed tactics. Putin probably was misled by his general that the same thing would work, artillery barrage and then the enemy moves in. But what if the other chap has got some sophisticated missiles which the Americans gave the Ukrainians? The whole battle, well, what happens when the enemy has got sophisticated weapons and the Americans gave them plenty of them, but there was a drawback. These people were not properly trained. So the Russians had breathing space. They withdrew and they attacked in the eastern region, that is the Donbass region, where there was a majority of Russian support. They made some headway there, captured about 20% territory, but that's not a very big deal if you look at it, not a very big deal at all. Because in six months of fighting, if you're going to show this paltry territory which you have captured, it's got no, it's got no meaning. It doesn't mean anything. And you haven't been able to change the regime. And you have now the Russians are forced to negotiate and agree with Ukraine to allow them to export grain. And once the export of grain starts, dollars will flow in back into the Ukrainian economy. It will become more resilient and there will be more assistance to the Russians. So my way of thinking is, that, as an expert, that the Russian battle in Ukraine 
is not a success. You can't say it's a failure. No, but it's not a success. And definitely not on the way the Indian Army had moved in East Pakistan. If people will rec rec recollect in the 1971 war, the battle was over in 13 days, an area as big as France. But this has been fighting on for six months and the Russians achieved nothing. Probably it will continue for another six months, a stalemate or something, and then finally, you know, the whatever Russia has captured, the territory remained with them. But talking of militarily, I don't think the Russian army is all that hot. That's my personal assessment of the whole situation. There could be so many reasons for it. Lack of motivation, that is one. And the fact that these Russians have become soft. Everybody wants the goodies of life. Nobody wants to go and die fighting on the front. And that's one of the reasons which is going against Russia. Now, China is also in a similar vein. Let's look at the Chinese military. They haven't fought a war since 1979 when they fought against North Vietnam. And they weren't very successful there. The Chinese army which fought in the 1950 battles against the Americans in the Korean War is a different proposition. That time, the People's Army overran MacArthur and so panicked on MacArthur that he told Truman, let's drop atomic bombs on China. Ultimately, he was dismissed and General Ridgeway was brought in as the Army Chief, Commander. But that is over. They fought a border war in 62, which is not a judge at all. The Indians were not ready, you know, they were sitting with their pants down and they lost. So, it's not to be counted as a great victory. The fact is, that for the last 40 years, the Chinese have not fought any war. They have been fighting some local insurgency in the Xinjiang province against the Muslims. And uh, that's a very low-key battle, you know. So the first thing is, they lack battle experience. And this was the problem with the Americans also when they went into Vietnam. And when they went into Korea. They hadn't fought that type of war. The jungle war, the guerrilla war, you know, they hadn't fought it. It was a new thing for them and that is they plundered. Now let's not talk about that. Talking about the Chinese, I've been reading and you all have been reading the Chinese have been practicing drills. They've been firing rockets all around Taiwan. And they are looking ahead how to carry out a landing in Taiwan. But I think it's all bravado. It can't, there's nothing behind it. There's no metal because this is, the Chinese themselves are not convinced. Now, talk of the Chinese army, it's a cons army which is conscripted by force. A lot of soldiers, I think 30% of them, come from all walks of life, serve four years and go away. There is a big morale problem there. Now, I must uh, amplify to you all what it is. China has been long been following the one-child policy. One child means if you have one daughter, you have one. You can't have another one. And if you have a son, you don't have any other more children. The one China policy, one son policy, played havoc with the Chinese society. With the result that those people who had only one son, they were reluctant to send him into the army. And by chance, if he died, then what would be the result? You know, the entire race would be extinguished. That particular clan would not exist. So this one son syndrome, as coupled with the one child syndrome, is a great moral, a negative effect on the Chinese army. That is one. And secondly, the Chinese haven't fought anywhere. And it's easy to talk. The Americans have been losing, but they've been fighting. They fought in Afghanistan, they fought in Iran, uh, and they fought in uh, Iraq, they fought in Vietnam, they fought in Korea. Whether they lose or win, but they, got, they have battle experience. While the Chinese have no battle experience. I think in the recent clash with India, they didn't do pretty well as they would have liked. And the net result is, that also the propaganda is going on. And propaganda, of course, anybody can talk anything about propaganda. Say, oh, we done this, we done that. But that's got no meaning, really. 
So the Chinese army also is in the same boat as the Russian army. Equipment, sophistication and weaponry are no substitute for victory, let me tell you. Because victory is won by the infantry soldier and no lesser man than Barnard Montgomery has stated in his history of warfare. Even Sun Tzu accepted that the infantry soldier is the key, is the key to a battle. He has to hold the ground. You may have rockets, missiles, you keep firing and you win with drones and all that. Who's going to go and occupy the land? Who's going to occupy it? Drones can't go and occupy the land. It has to be the infantry soldier. So the armies of both the United, uh, sorry, the Russians and the Chinese are not at their apex at their best. I don't think they are going to win any war on their own. And if the Chinese try something in Vietnam, uh, in Formosa, it's not going to be easy for them to run over, over on the island. So they are just carrying out threatening drills. And they are following the old Chinese policy, military policy laid down by Sun Tzu to scare the enemy. So they are trying to scare the Vietnamese, you know, the, sorry, the Taiwanese. Now, what happens next? And how does it compare with the American army? The American army has also got a great mistake, committing the mistake, because they don't have the manpower, so they are relying on sophistication, weaponry. Now, that doesn't win you war, as I've already pointed out. They tried carpet bombing in Vietnam, more dropped more bombs on North Vietnam than they dropped on Germany in the entire World War II. They lost in Korea, MacArthur panicked. General Westmoreland was made the supreme commander in uh, Vietnam. He didn't do anything. He went home, zero. They carried out a big battle in Afghanistan. So many chiefs came, 20 years fighting, net result, another zero. So what are we, where do we lead from here? What do we do? What do we say? That the American military has the cutting edge. Yes, it has the cutting edge. But that's about all. They cannot execute that cutting edge to victory. They haven't been able to do it. Unless the opponent is very inferior. They won the war in Iraq, and but that was again a very pirate victory when General Mattis, who later became the Defense Secretary, was one of the commanders. And there was a lot of talk that Mattis, the Hermit General and God knows what and all, but Mattis himself, if he was to face the Russians, he would have a tough time. Now the question arises, what happens next? The Russian, Chinese and American militaries, in my opinion, are not on par as to what they were in the Second World War. If you remember, the Americans were hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the Japanese and they prevailed. At that time, the American soldiers had a different get-up, a different morale. The Russians followed their tactics, whatever it was, maybe, artillery, barrage, infantry falling, but they won against the Germans. And of course, the Chinese were a defeated lot even by the Japanese in the Second World War. They got no military history as such. They were a prosperous kingdom, even in the Middle Ages, but that's about all. Now, coming down to which is the army, which is the best, it's very difficult to pinpoint. Though I would still place the Russian army a little shade ahead of both the Chinese and the American army. Uh, people are, well, might ask me, what about the Indian army? <laughs> How good is the Indian army? It's very good, yes. But the recent changes which have been brought about by the government, like having the Agnipath scheme and all that, they're playing havoc with the army. And the army is no longer going to be the fighting force it was, which faced Rommel and Yamamoto, the Japanese generals. It's a different army. And uh, how good it is, you can well imagine that in four wars, 65, 48, 71, 98, the Indian army could not advance beyond eight or ten miles into Pakistan territory on the Western Front. Nobody can deny that. In 47, Nehru lost heart and the army also agreed and they called for a ceasefire. 71 war, no progress. 
65 war there is no strategic sense left out east pakistan and when they attacked the law and chalkot seven sector couldn't go beyond five to six miles and that was the end of it they couldn't cross the ishigal canal on the way to lahore 98 war kargil war half the kargil hills at the end of the war was still with the pakistan army and it is the americans who forced them to withdraw because pakistan wanted a peace ceasefire and Musharraf was gambled badly. So all this doesn't mean that uh, these armies cannot fight. Basic is, problem is, if a country is threatened, probably we, these soldiers will give a better account. Because when you fight for your motherland or fatherland, it's got a meaning. But when you go ahead and fight something else, you know, like in Ukraine, you're going and fighting, the soldier doesn't know the reason the attack. Why is he fighting? What for? Same thing with the Americans when they're fighting in Afghanistan. Many soldiers are asking, what the hell are we doing here? Vietnam, why are we here? Why are we fighting in Korea? But if America to be, to be threatened, it would be a different game. Similarly, if Russia was under threat, it would be a different game. Coming to the Chinese army, Chinese, well, in numbers, they are the maximum force in the world. I think about 2.5 million standing armies. This is a huge number. But numbers alone don't win, though concentration of force is one of the principles of war, close, enunciated by Clausewitz. But then there's so many other factors involved. There's got to be leadership, there's got to be flexibility, so many, so and so forth. And I don't think the Chinese army is conducive. Because earlier when the Chinese were fighting, they didn't believe in the rank system. There were no ranks in the Chinese army at one stride during the liberation war and then later on when they started uh, having ranks and generals and all that but i don't think in my personal opinion the chinese army is of any value in fact out of all the three armies which i have counted the chinese would be the worst off it's like a dragon without teeth the teeth the teeth are missing the russians would be the best of the lot at the moment but that is if they are threatened now russia Fighting in Ukraine makes no sense for the average Russian, say in Moscow or Kyiv, going to the nightclubs, having a good time. What the hell he says of fighting in Ukraine? What, 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 is, what, what is that thing? So motivation is very important. Most of these armies lack motivation. And even Ukraine, there's no motivation to fight, frankly, because they were the same people with the Russians and many... Uh, Ukrainians are feeling, why the hell are we fighting the Russians? What for? We, we were together for almost 80 years, 100 years, and Ukraine has been no great power. It's been just propped up by the Americans. Well, gentlemen, I've given you a general assessment of the three armies. That is the Russian army. I don't consider it to be the force it was. The Chinese are the worst off. I don't think they're going to win any wars. And the Americans are good but they lack manpower and the motivation to fight. See, the America is no longer the America it was there. There's a lot of happiness now in America among the people. They want to enjoy life. They want, nobody wants to die fighting. The Indian army has been destroyed by the government. And there is also, in my opinion, a bit of a schism in the officer-man relationship. If you see the canteen and the other uh, groups which are on Facebook and other social media sites, you can discern that there is some sort of a divide building up. And once you have a divide, you can't fight. Pakistan, I think we can write off. But they're good fighters when they defend their own homeland. Okay, gentlemen, I think I'll close now. I hope you enjoyed listening to this small talk. Uh, I just, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to give you an individual reply. You can email me, you can even put it in the comments, and I'll give you a reply. I close now, gentlemen, and I wish you all the best. Please subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends, with all the people known to you. And here, I will close. It's starting to rain. I'm comfortably sitting in my SU, SUV, and I will say, Jai Hind. Take care and God bless.